first uh, Legal Mondo webinar. I'm very uh, happy to uh, to open uh, the event. We have uh, participants, attendees from four continents, and we're very happy with the numbers. So thank you very much for for joining us. And for those who do not know Legal Mondo, we are a platform of international independent lawyers. We're now present in uh, 47 uh, countries. And uh, if you want to know more, you can get in touch with me after the event, or you can head to our uh, website and you will find there all the relevant uh, uh, information. Um, I'm very happy uh, to leave the floor to our uh, panelists and I'll pass the mic to Johan Miren to introduce our webinar today. Thank you, Johan. Thank you very much, Roberto, and welcome everyone. And I'm very happy to see that we have so many people registered for the seminar, for the webinar. And I also see a lot of familiar faces, which makes me extra happy, of course. As many of you know, my name is Ivan Miren, and I'm a founding partner of a Swedish law firm called Cedric Law, specializing in international tax, but we also do corporate work and M&A related assignments as well. Before we get started, I would like to do some housekeeping, so to say, um, given the fact that this is the first webinar, we have set up some rules and we have decided that the audio and video will be muted for all participants, which means that if you, during the webinar, have any questions or something that you would like to add, please use the Q&A function in your Zoom application. You will find it at the bottom where you have sort of the toolbox for the various functions in the, in the, for, for the Zoom control panel. And I will do my best to, to address the various questions that I hope that we will receive through, through the Q&A function. And uh, we are, of course, here today uh, to discuss what is going on in the COVID-19 situation. But rather than sort of discussing where we are right now, we will try to peek over the horizon and see what we can learn together for how we can prepare for a return to normal or as some say, the new normal. And we will have a special focus on communication. And hopefully, at least that is my, my hope for this webinar, that is that we will try to explore what me and a lot of other people are calling business as unusual, sort of, as I said before, the new normal. <clears throat> I just want to make an important remark before we sort of, before we move on, because the fact that we are keeping our eyes on the horizon and are going to talk about the future should not in any way be interpreted as if we are disrespectful or doesn't recognize what is going on in the world at the moment. For us, it truly goes without saying that we indeed recognize the great personal sacrifices that the current crisis has implied for many people. We realize, of course, and we admit that it is a privilege for us to be able to discuss the future when so many people around the world are struggling just on a day-to-day -day basis. I think, from my personal side that it is important to start with this remark um, because it is truly an odd and new situation for all of us. But to discuss what lies over the horizon, as I said, uh, I'm pleased to welcome my friends and co-panelists for this webinar, Deborah Foreman and Larry Markowitz. Based in Toronto, 
the Canada Debra of Prince Drive Coaching is a well-known name to many of us. She is an acknowledged expert in law firm management and professional coaching. The fact that her business grows almost exclusively out of referrals shows the quality of her coaching work and her coaching abilities. Since forming Pinstrap Coaching back in 2008, Deborah has worked with more than 2,500 clients across the globe and has provided over 30,000 hours of coaching services with a special focus then, as many of us know, on business development and uh, practice management. Um, she also rewrote the book, Maximizing Law Firm Profitability, and has produced over 160 business development videos, blog posts, etc. Based in Montreal, Canada, we have Larry Markowitz, who serves as a senior advisor and financial communications and investor relations at National Public Relations. He's helping his clients deliver the right message to the right people at the right time. National is Canada's largest public relations firm and is part of a global family of specialist communications firm called Avenir that has offices in 24 locations throughout Europe and North America. Larry has spent more than 15 years as a business lawyer practicing securities law, competition law, and foreign investment law. More recently, he has helped to launch several businesses, including an award-winning social enter enterprise that finances clean energy products. Going in a little bit to the subject that Deborah and Larry will be discussing today, I would can, like- Can to... Larry be unmuted? Because then he won't be able to participate. For some reason, okay. he keeps getting muted. Okay, okay, he was on mute. That's not yeah. a good thing. That's not a good start. <laughs> and, I, and I promise it wasn't me. <laughs> I won't Very touch good. anything. Okay. Can you hear okay. me? Good. Yeah. Welcome Sorry back, Larry. That. We are happy to see you again. I heard the introduction. <laughs> Thank you for your kind introduction. <laughs> oh, perfect, perfect. Uh, I was just going to say that when looking at the crisis like the one that we have at hand, we have together in, in the panel, identified three different phases. It's the phase of preparation, which is the first one. Then we have the response phase and the recovery phase. The preparation phase is sort of the first one. It's when we are setting our plans on how to meet uh, a crisis like the one that we have at hand. Uh, the response phase, that is where we currently are. Uh, <clears throat> we need to implement our plans, our strategies on how to face the crisis that is ongoing. And the last phase is the recovery phase. And that is where, what, what I call the horizon, where we sort of want to keep our eyes on the future going forward. We don't know what this phase will look like, I mean, will it be, as I said before, business as unusual, or will it be back to normal? However, it is now the time to start thinking, to start planning about what will the recovery phase look like. <clears throat> and I'm truly looking forward to get Deborah's and Larry's views on this when we are our going into to the questions that we have in front of us. And as I said before, communication is sort of the centerpiece of this short webinar. And we know that communication is always important. I mean, it's, it's important how we communicate in many different respects. But given the current pandem pandemic and given the fact that we have a flow of information coming over us on a daily basis that we need to evaluate. I, on a personal note, I find it perhaps more important than ever to have a strategy on how to communicate. 
on how to get the message out there. And Deborah, given your ex experience and sort of before we jump in to the, the different categories of questions that we have, have identified, I really would like to have your valuable input and your thoughts on why is communication so important in this time of the crisis? Thanks, you and, and Larry, welcome back. Thank you. Um, everything we do is communication and we are only as good and as effective as the last thing that we say. And that's why regardless of, um, I mean, it, it would be a total another webinar and another day to talk about what even constitutes a crisis. But I mean, you know, there, there was a little mini crisis we had here that our, our co-panelist was blocked and we were trying to find a way to get him on. So that might seem to someone is quite trivial, but you know, Larry was sitting there trying to break into this discussion when it was ready for him to do so and he was muted. So that is an example of a crisis, if you will, and not one that we planned. But I think we effectively solved that one. But communication is really about someone getting their message across to someone else and then directing them to act on what they are saying. If you think back to the most basic of the two cans, that someone will have one can with a string to another, you have to look that person, the other person in the eyes to say, do you hear me? Like, are you listening to me? And, and Larry was even doing that to me, I muted. And it, it, was, it was really getting it back to the most basic communication of, you know, help me here. And what we see on any given day are people will communicate. People like to talk and people, what they have to make sure that they're doing is A, talking about something that others want to hear. Talk, and, and, it's, and it is strategic all the time. Is this the right time for you to say what you want to say? And I think it was really nice, you know, and how you, how you positioned our talk to say that, yes, you know, we're, we're looking over the curve, but, but we're not doing it, you know, stomping on the people that have suffered as we've gotten to where we are now. So again, it's ensuring that our message is done in a way that people will hear. You know, what, what happens when people will want something, they, they, they have something that they want to know. I mean, I think probably the biggest question people are asking now is when is this pandemic going to be over? Well, who knows? But people get frustrated by it and they want answers and they want someone to do it. And we'll, we'll be looking at how leaders have been responding. But it, it is, communication is a two-way thing. People want answers and it's how we respond and, and what we do. And I think what I have found very interesting in this whole thing is that when, when we communicate, there can be one person who communicates and has a message. Then when you get what's called groupthink or group talk, you get a bunch of people saying the same thing and then it's like a stampede. And we saw that at the beginning of this uh, pandemic. And you know, again, I'm, I'm looking at it from when it, 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 the, the wave kind of started to hit from the main two, three countries that it did. So I, I'm, I use this my kind of line in the sand, March, March 12th, but it was the hoarding. It was that hoarding mentality. And that's what people were communicating to the world that I am, you know, I'm in a, a, a survivalist way and what they hoarded, I mean, I know there are memes and people were laughing and saying, you know, it was the toilet paper and the meat and the pasta, you know, depending where you were. And I know people were saying, hey, you do realize that this is another kind of flu. It's not, it's not the one you need all the toilet paper, but people saw that as survival. And what they communicated was this greed and this hoarding. And then, you know, if I, if, if I may, I'm gonna bring that over to the legal world where people were hoarding the information of saying, okay, listen to me, clients, listen to me, those of you that are locked in your, in your houses, I've got information that you need to hear. And that's when we were bombarded by daily memos and, you know, force majeure was the first one and it started in February and I thought, wow, that's smart. And then it kept coming, it kept coming because it became starting group things. Someone's saying, well, wait a minute, if Canada's doing this, I better do this. And if this one's doing it, I better do it. And then everyone was doing it because they didn't want to miss the train. And that becomes a very desperate form of communication. And what happens is people stop listening. And in the digital world, or when we are sending out information like that, they unsubscribe. They sit there and say, you know what? I don't need this. I've got enough going on in my day. I don't need stuff, especially when people were not being prepared, were not targeting in a way they were basically 
because again, and we're gonna talk in a second about being prepared, they, they, just, they just dumped their mailing list with everything so that their plumber was getting uh, something on force majeure or I was getting some plumber saying about how they keep their hands clean. And, and you've got to think about relevance. And so you unsubscribe. But in, in the end, we, we've got, and I, I'll use this as a segue, you want to, to pass the ball if Larry doesn't have anything to say on this, but it, regardless of how unprepared and unexpecting we are of any situation, any second you take to, to kind of recalibrate and reposition yourself to say, wait a minute, what am I going to say? Who am I going to say it to? What do I want them to do? And how am I going to do it? Will make it a much more effective and you, and you really will then hit the target that you want to hit. Johan, I think you started with a good message and, and uh, Deborah alluded to this. Uh, you started out with uh, empathy. Communication nowadays needs to be empathetic and communication has to make, you have to make sure you're not being tone deaf as Deborah alluded to. What is fortunate is that this, pre this crisis is so unprecedented that people naturally will make mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes as long as you're being transparent and trying your best. If you make a mistake, apologize or switch your message and move on. And it's time to communicate frequently, particularly with your employees because they're nervous about their finances and about their health. Uh, so don't hesitate to communicate frequently, but make it about them. Don't make it all about yourself. Uh, so instead of sending force majeure uh, memos, think about how force majeure affects your clients and send that memo so with a bit of analysis. Larry, looking sort of at the, the preparation phase of a crisis and as, as a lawyer, I mean, as, as we are lawyers, we like to look in the rear mirror to sort of to see what have we learned from previous crises in order to prepare for the next one. And I'm sort of wondering what, what could we have done differently in, in order to be, be prepared? Is it even possible to be, be prepared for a global pandemic and for a total hold to the economy that we are seeing in many countries? Well, this is so unprecedented because not only is it a financial crisis, which we have seen before, it's also a health crisis. So in, say, 2008, things went down, the stock market crashed, people lost their jobs, and then we rebuilt. Now what's happening is things went down, but we don't quite know what the shape of the recovery curve is going to be. Probably it won't be a V-shaped curve because uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. We don't know when this is going to be over. Uh, could you have predicted a pandemic? No, but all businesses, lawyers or their clients have to be ready with a, a crisis preparation plan, have a crisis preparation team in place, have an idea of who's going to speak for the company vis-a-vis -vis your clients, vis-a-vis -vis your own employees. Uh, and it's not too late to start because uh, not to be the bearer of bad news, but you know, we're uh, flattening the curve right now, but most experts predict that there's going to be at least one more wave, if not two, in this pandemic. So you'll reopen your offices cautiously. You'll have to tell your employees uh, what kind of safety precautions you're taking to make sure they're safe. But it's not unlikely that somebody's going to be hit by the virus in your office and you'll have to disinfect and you'll have to put everyone in quarantine for two weeks. So have those messages ready to go you can make those kinds of preparations. There's also an increased likelihood of cyber attacks nowadays. Be ready for that. What are you gonna say? How are you gonna deal with it? Again, always show empathy to the victims of whatever the problem is um, and uh, be clear and succinct in your message. So I'll be succinct and hand it back to you. But yeah, and I, I, I think, you know, just to, to grab on your words, Yon, about the rear view mirror, there's been a lot of that um, with people saying, well, should we have acted this? I mean, I know in, in Canada, there was the issue, should we have worn the mask? Do we wear the mask now? I mean, in the end, it is everyone is, is, is trying their best to see themselves out of this. It's like standing every day on, on a different type of quicksand. And it's, it's thinking, what do we do? And, and you've got to look forward. So in, in the last seven, eight, nine weeks, however long people have been in their respective lockdown, it's the preparation's already been going on because you you landed in wherever you are 
and you've already been building in processes that you might not realize that you've done and that you are already thinking, okay, when, when we do go back to the office, how are we going to be doing it? We're going to do it in teams. We're going to do it in waves. What makes sense? How have we been coping now? How have we been doing phone calls now? I mean, I've been hearing from so many people saying that they've been almost in better contact now than they were for years in the office because they're finding the time and they're making the time and, and they're, they're feeling that need for community. Because in the end, it, it is this feeling of community. And, and you know, and I, I have found it quite, quite amusing that I've had a lot of people say, I never thought I would say, but I really, I, I always wanted to work from home. And yeah, it's fine, I'm doing it and I might have to do it more, but boy, do I miss going into the office because I get that separation. So, but, but then some are saying it's been great because I've been home with the kids. So it's, it's going to be that balance, but I think people don't, shouldn't look and say, okay, I'll, I'll have to plan for this. You're in it now. And you've been in it since it started. And you might not have had the, the, the foresight or, you know, it's very funny that we're in 2020 and we didn't have the 2020 vision, but you, you're in it now. So there's no excuse. You, you've got to, every day you do something that's a new process to push forward whatever it is that you're doing. And it's, you know, it's interesting. We've never been so separated yet. We've never been so close. Here we are peering into each other's homes. You have a nice bookshelf, Deborah, I see. Um, <laughs> and and uh, we're all separate, but yet we're here with our friends from four different continents. Uh, kind of ironic. Oh, it's, 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 it's amazing to, to sort of to explore the technology that we have actually had at hand for quite some time, but suddenly we are also using it in a way which perhaps we haven't used it before. And uh, I think it's a very interesting message that you are pointing out there, Larry, when pointing to the fact that these different phases of the crisis, that they are almost floating into each other, that we, even in a recovery phase, should go back to the phase of preparation just to safeguard that we, we sort of we are prepared for a second wave or a third wave or, or whatever will, will, will come our way. Uh, and also, I mean, the fact that, as, as was pointed out here, the fact that people have been in their homes for many, many weeks, I think that that also makes people really be on their edge. And when, when it comes to, to communications, I mean, how can organizations, be it law firms or corporate clients or whatever, prepare and address these concerns that people are, are really starting to, to suffer from when staying at home for so many weeks. If I might jump in the, to, to begin on this, um, I think it's important if you're managing people to keep in constant contact. At my public relations firm, for example, we normally have a once a week in-person team meeting. Now we have one every morning. Uh, it's important for uh, the management to know who's doing what so they could share the uh, work evenly between us. But I think there's also a, a a psychological or a, a mental health aspect to it, to uh, keep people feeling that they're being heard, to keep people feeling that they're part of a team, and this keeps them motivated. Uh, if people don't hear from you, whether they're inside your company or outside, uh, rumors will fill that vacuum. So you have to impart information, but also gather information on a regular basis within your company. So I think uh, increased internal communication is very important, especially. Also, it provides a structure and uh, people crave routine and structure. Um, when, when I work with clients that get transitioned out of positions, the first thing I say to them is looking for a job is a job. You'll, you'll wake up every morning, you're going to, you know, and I, and I, I know that people have been laughing that um, you know, they, they come on these things and you know, they'll say to me, you know, are you wearing your pajamas on the bottom? No, I'm, I'm, I'm dressed as if I'd be in a meeting now, because to me, that's how I do it. You, you've, got to, you've got to dress and, and, and work the part. And it's, and it's the same thing here. If people know, I mean, I can use our example. Our prime minister does daily talks, the, the chief health officer, that there's daily talks. So even if people don't like what they're hearing, it's this consistent messaging here. That we, and, and there is a big difference between responding and answering. And this is whether you're dealing with a pandemic or someone your client has asked you a question, your associate has asked you a question. Don't think when someone asks you, what about X, that you need to have the answer. 
they just want you to know that you got it. It's like, okay, I'm on it. I, I don't have the answer. I think it might be this, I'll get back to you. But too often people sit there and say, you know what? They never asked me to do this. I don't know what it is, so I'm gonna push it off. And I'm sitting there saying, where are they? Why haven't I heard from them? What's going on? And then my head starts you know, playing games. So when you're in a, a situation like this where everyone's isolated, they're not working as a team, they're, they're really sometimes not sure what's going on, they, they need that structure, they need that consistency, they need to have that idea that someone has their back because then they feel, okay, as the world is shifting, at least I feel I've got some constants in my life that are anchoring me to what I have to do. But I mean, the, the, the message here is then to keep in contact, keep up routines and admit that you from time to time don't have the answer. Uh, could the, the fact that we are distancing ourselves at the moment, social distancing, is it, is it so that social media could be used as a tool in order to achieve the fact that we should keep in contact, keep routines, and admit that we from time to time don't have the answer? How can well, we utilize a modern medium like the social media? It could be useful in, in a few ways. Um, there are many ways to take this. It's important to maintain a dialogue with all of your uh, all of your uh, stakeholders. So whether it's your employees or your clients or your customers, um, and social media is made for dialogue. It's a two-way medium. Sometimes people make crazy comments, but there's a place for proper uh, sounding board, serving as a proper sounding board of your customers, for example, to hear what they have to say and to, re to respond in real time again, so no rumors fill the void. Um, in terms of lawyers, uh, you know, again, put your analysis uh, that you send to clients, put it on social media. Uh, you could also use traditional media as a lawyer uh, in terms of uh, uh, marketing, for example. If you get yourself positioned with your local reporters as some kind of expert, uh, hopefully on something you actually know about, uh, it's a great uh, way to get your name out there while you wait for business to pick up again. I mean, social media is, is again, one of the double-edged swords in communicating. I mean, it is a great tool. Social, um, like LinkedIn came into being because of 2008. Uh, before, the, be, before that crisis started, there were two guys who got laid off. They were feeling lonely. So they said, hey, let's set up this LinkedIn, which is what it is. Um, and we know what Facebook, <clears throat> excuse me, what Facebook started off was, what, you know, only guys at university said, you know, we want to find some girls, let's, let's set up Facebook. So these different um, um, mediums will start up because people are looking for community. But with anything that you use, regardless of, of how dire a situation is, you've got to use it critically and effectively. So, so again, just because it's, it's like the pajama analogy, just because you're at home with social media, uh, sorry, that you're home, um, in, in, in the lockdown, it doesn't mean that you've got to get all of a sudden loose with your with your um, conversation and your communication on so, on on social media. It never dies. Uh, anything that goes out on the internet is there for life. It could go to court. And, you know, this could just turn around and bite you where you don't want it to bite you. So you've got to use the same restraints, the same holding yourself back that nanosecond and say, Do I really want to put this out? Do I really want to send you know this? you know, this little uh, cute little video, because I think it's funny. It's, yes, it's immediate. Yes, it's a good way to, to grab people. I've been very happy that I've had clients ask me to look at their, their CVs because they finally said, I'm finally embracing LinkedIn. Because for them now, they see the importance of doing it. But with everything that you do, it gets back to the basics. You know, am I, at, why am I sharing my message and how am I doing it? There's another use of social media, which is maybe in a different context. Some of us have clients, for example, that are manufacturers. Uh, manufacturers need to um, uh, communicate with their employees, particularly to reassure them that they're putting the right sanitary measures in place. Sometimes uh, email is not the way you get to a factory worker, but very often they'll have a smartphone, they'll be a part of Facebook start a Facebook group where you communicate with the employees in your factory. So it's also simply a mode of communication, uh, maybe not as public a mode as Twitter where you could get into arguments, but more of a back and forth on specifics for how your factory is going to work as we move through the pandemic. 
And as a leader of an organization, there you sort of also recognize the fact that there are ways to communicate which would be much more accessible and would be reachable for your employees. Uh, I, I want to go back a little bit to the fact that it is so important to have a concise um, message uh, when you when you communicate. I mean, I I'm among those admirers of, of Governor Cuomo in New York because I think that his ability to communicate in an easy and accessible way and also to show leadership during the crisis has been quite quite, quite impressive for me. Uh, and he appears to be both concise and calm when sort of delivering his message. Uh, however, I hear from friends and business contacts that in various organizations, at least in, in my home country, it seems to be the fact that it is very hard to communicate in, in, in a manner that sort of brings one message to the table. If you take a law firm, for instance, we see law firms where partners are using different words in order to describe what perhaps is the same strategy. But if you don't use the same language, if you don't use the same words, well, the message will be split in a way. And it will be very, very hard for the associates, for the employees of the organization to, to fully grasp what the organization wants to communicate. Um, um, what what is your take on this, Larry? Well, to start with, uh, Andrew Cuomo, he's a very good communicator. He uses PowerPoint presentations and so forth. The lesson we can learn from him is he uses simple language. So, for example, he keeps repeating, stay home, save lives, for monosyllabic words. Uh, even if you're communicating to lawyers who like to use big words, still try to use simple words and keep repeating the same message. Now, if you have a large law firm where you have a hierarchy and you have the management that's speaking to the, the underlings, shall we say, um, you wanna make sure to the extent possible that they impart a consistent message. Uh, and to do so, what I would recommend and what we do for our clients is we uh, put down key messages, you know, three or four key messages using simple language. Uh, and we even prepare a Q&A, a question and answer, uh, where we put down anticipated questions and how they should answer. And it doesn't mean they have to read those answers to their underlings when they get a question, but at least they'll have an idea of the general direction they should take it. Um, in some cases, and this would be even more ideal, have an official spokesman in your company. Uh, this is more for the outside world. Don't have everyone speaking for the company. Have one spokesperson who can communicate with the media, with whoever is gonna call in with questions. Uh, ideally, you again, give them key messages and Q and A samples so they know where to go. Uh, ideally, you'd also want them to have professional training. They should practice a, a sort of press conference type of situation uh, with you uh, out loud. And uh, they should learn to be concise and get to the point, not go off on tangents. Uh, look in the camera, wh whatever it is they need, to, depending on, on on the situation they'll be faced with. So uh, consistent messaging, small, wor small words, be concise uh, and, uh, and uh, practice. The one, the one thing about any crisis and how you communicate it, it gives someone who might not have been too successful an opportunity to clean up their act. Um, I'm speaking about, um, I'm sure everyone knew about the mayor, former mayor of Toronto, who the, the crack smoking Rob Ford, who sadly had quite an unfortunate death by cancer a few years ago. His brother is now running our province. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like the oak, the, you know, the, 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 the seed that doesn't fall too far from the, the tree. They're very similar, but I never thought in my life I would ever say, wow, he has been a very effective leader. And it's something that is, is being said throughout Toronto and throughout Ontario, where Toronto is based, that this guy has really shocked and pleasantly surprised people because he has been staying on message. He has, he's, he's had our back. 
He has been a very strong leader. He's been saying, look, I don't have all the answers. He was the first one in Canada to share the information that he was getting about the modeling. And he said, you know what? I'm not gonna be the only one that gets this news. Let me give it to you. And which was a bit of a, a wild card, but it worked. Because people said, wow, this is awful. And, and it's gotten better than what uh, the modelers had thought, but he decided, and again, I don't know how prescient it was that he thought, okay, this is really gonna help me you know, in, in the polls, but he just really you know, took charge. And I think a leader of whether it's a firm or whether, you know, where, wherever it is, anytime you communicate, it is your opportunity to fix what was the last thing you said. And, you know, there, there might, there isn't always going to be the right answer. And I remember someone told me many years ago, the difference between a good lawyer and a bad lawyer is that a good lawyer knows when they make a mistake and not to do it again. And that's how you want to make sure that, yes, you might not have said the right thing, Mea culpa, admit it. Say, you know what? I screwed up here. This was not right, but this is, we were going on wrong information. This is what we thought, but now we have righted the ship and this is what we're going to do. We hope this is the right way. If it's not, we're going to let you know, and then we're going to continue to find our path. But together, and we, there's a, and I think it's global. I know it's in Canada. We are all in this together. And that is something that's been coming down more in the, in the press and in the media. We are all in this together so that no one has one answer, but together this mass of people are going to communicate together and take that group think that I said was like hoarding, put it all to good and say how we're all gonna to go together and make this work. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, Doug, Doug Ford has been uh, quite humble, which is a change in his image. And uh, we don't have to talk about Ontario, Canada politics, but it applies to any kind of leader. Uh, he's also worked with his enemies which hopefully you don't have too many in your law firm, but uh, now's not the time to be fighting. Well, and also I think it's it's good to know at a law firm when it is time to to break from party lines. When 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 you have to sit there and look for the public, you know, for the for the general good of of the firm. Because I know that there are some people, and I've heard this, that as soon as they saw what was going on, they right away, it's, it's like they pulled the carpet from underneath the table. They started locking down the money. They started saying, okay, we're going to get rid of these people because they were protecting themselves. They didn't want to go through what they did in 2008. That is not being a leader. That, that is someone who is sitting there saying, it's all about me. And it is important because, you know, and, and another expression I keep hearing, someone just sent me it today, you know, even this will pass. And, and it is, it is getting better and, and people are getting better and, and, and hopefully no one's gonna get numb to it because when we get numb, that's when we know there's a problem that this then becomes not even a new normal, becomes normal. It's, it's, we want it to still hurt. We want to still feel the pain of what's going on. We want to still be, be afraid because if not, we're not gonna learn from what's going on. Leaders are going to be remembered yeah. for, for how they behaved at this time. Uh, and, and if you're hiring people, for example, in the future, they're going to ask, what measures did you take to protect your employees? Uh, hopefully you'll have a good answer and hopefully your reputation, your brand as an employer will be maintained and perhaps enhanced in this situation. Yeah, but, but isn't it so, I mean, that to communicate with people that are worried. As we said before, people are on the edge. They are worried about their jobs and thereby in the long run about having money in order to put food on the table. That's sort of, that's the basic need that we are talking about. And isn't it so that to show leadership under those circumstances requires something more than just be humble or? It's Someone just posed, um, Giuseppe Scotti just posed a question, I don't know if you saw it, about saying that um, Queen Elizabeth has, has to him, I mean, I, I can, he, he said that the best demonstration of leadership is being offered by Queen Elizabeth in her speech to the nation. I think that the lack of leadership is, is a major issue in managing the crisis and the reconstruction phase. Nobody will be able to take the lead at the global level. Do you believe that problem will produce a shockingly less globalized world? I. I feel that this people are looking at this globally. Um, I, I think we wouldn't have, I mean, it's, it's, it's been very unusual that I've been speaking with another Canadian, but that, that we have two countries here that are, that are very different. I mean, that we have some similar similarities, but everyone is, is being affected by this a lot in their own domestic way that their culture and that what happens in their country is gonna affect them. 
but I think there is a global response. And there, there's been, I mean, sadly, the, the nursing homes has been something that not one country in this world has escaped. I mean, the, and, and that is something that hopefully globally, there's going to be a response to how those nursing homes are run. Why is it that, that, that the, the elderly have been so vulnerable? Every, I mean, I mean, there are obvious reasons why they would be, but that the numbers have been shocking. And in so much so, and, and, I, and I told them, I'm not joking, I told my, my kids, you are not to put me in a nursing home, shoot me. If, if I get to some point, but you are not to put me into a nursing home because I would not trust going into a nursing home after seeing what's been going on. And it is global. And I think there are ways of, of communicating. And I think you know there, there was the attempt with the G20 and I know that there are certain countries that opted out not to do that. I know that there's been some global issues with how the WHO has handled it. And some countries have said that they don't like how that is. So people are looking at it globally, but the, things have to be incremental. And I think that there, as, as with everything, like even in a, in a government, like in, in, in our country, we have both the provincial, we have three levels. We have municipal, provincial and federal. And there'll be some levels that are dealt with at whichever immediacy has to. But I think that there is no way this pandemic is going to escape without getting some global uh, decisions made on, on as, as Larry said at the beginning, you know, both health, and, and financial, and, and it's hard to know which kicked off the other, but they are definitely connected and, and that, we, that they, they will be attacked together, hopefully. I agree, we're all in this together, and, and so you could call it global in that sense, and here we are with people from four continents learning from one another. It's rare that we have an issue that we could all discuss where we're all on the same side uh, on everything. We all want this to pass and to survive, and in this case, to communicate effectively. But uh, since this is also a seminar on business advice, uh, I think global supply chains will become uh, less efficient, but more resilient. So instead of getting everything, say, from China, you'll have a diversity of sources of, uh, of supply and, and that sort of thing. You'll have more uh, emphasis on buying local. Certainly uh, here, there are campaigns put on by the government to support local commerces. And because we're not going to be able to travel very much, if at all, for the next while, people are going to turn more inward looking. There could be risks there also. Um, but um, speaking about the business angle, I think there are opportunities for us as lawyers. You know, be aware of what your clients are foreseeing. Uh, they may need different kinds of supply contracts, different kinds of clauses in case there's another wave. Uh, so as lawyers, we have to anticipate. At the end of the day, lawyers are entrepreneurs. So this sort of business advice is very important for us to consider. Um, so things may be a little less global. Um, so adapt yourself to that. One global thing, um, and they, they raised this in Canada yesterday, that bankruptcy um, is going to happen, but it probably won't happen till the fall because of all the governments that have been propping up um, the, the economy, whether it's, it's done by the, the forgiveness with, with leasing, with, with whatever. I mean, there, there was one Toronto lawyer who very, I thought, very smartly said it's, it's the great deferral, and, and it, but it will happen. So again, that could be the global response that people now can prepare for when things do, when, when the shift does hit the fan, which is going to happen, but they were just saying that people thought that because uh, they've been tracking how many companies have gone bankrupt. And they said that even before the pandemic started, there were some companies that were looking to go. Now, there, there being some immediate ones more in the restaurant, um, the, the, you know, the, the, some, some of the digital companies like um, I, I know that in, in Canada, Uber Eats is really getting whacked because of their, their greed for, for the, the money that they're taking. But, but different, com different companies are either showing their flaws in the pandemic by what I call the, the hoarding that's, that's going on, or that they, they were already on, on, on um, uh, a, a very um, rough footing before, and then it might be delayed, but, but there will be a global response because it's gonna be like dominoes. It's, it's just gonna kind of go through. So our, our next wave might not necessarily be with the health, but it'll be with the bankruptcy. And, and yeah, that could, I think and we're that there already. 
Yeah, we're there already. I mean, a number of our clients, uh, some I can't speak about, uh, are are on the in the process of uh, filing Chapter 11 or the Canadian version thereof. Uh, there's a lot of communication to do there. There's a lot of opportunities for lawyers, but there's communication with all the stakeholders. Often these are retail businesses which intend to continue to sell to their customers, even if it's just online. Uh, but at the same time, they're not paying their creditors. So they have to make sure it's clear in the public's mind that it's business as usual in the stores, but to their creditors that they're facing tough times and they're going to be arriving with a, pro a proposal soon. So there's a rule... Uh, room for both lawyers there and communication experts. Yeah, I mean, many of our clients will, of course, face financial difficulties given given the current situation. And I mean, our clients is perhaps the most important stakeholder in our businesses. Uh, but I, I wanted to... And if of... I could just put in a, a plug, I, I wrote a, a paper on this, which is on my, if you go to my LinkedIn, you'll see it. About ah. communicating as you restructure. Oh, Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> interesting, interesting. <laughs> uh, because I, I actually wanted to ask Deborah, because you use the phrase when it comes to sort of the frequency of communicating with our clients in these difficult times, you, you used uh, the headline for a blog post, it's okay to be silent, which of course is, 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 is a very interesting and intriguing title. But Generally speaking, how, how frequent should we communicate with our clients in a situation like this? I, I think you want to communicate as frequent. It, it's again, it's like with everything, it's that fine balance between not feeling like you're an ambulance chaser to, to being unctuous and, and, and obsequious. And people sit there and say, you know, they, they feel like they've been slimed, but, but, but showing that, that, that true empathy and the care. And so I've got clients that I'll just sit there and email and say, are everything okay? Are you doing okay? And I get people, I just had a, a client email me last night and, and she just said, look, I just want to make sure you're okay. And I said, no, I'm great. How are you? And, and it's, it's, it's been a really nice community that people are just reaching out and it's not saying, look, I need you or I, you know, the cha-ching, the, the cash register is going on, but it's, it's, it's letting people know. Now, you know, and I'm, and I'm in the back of my head, I'm thinking about what, what Giuseppe asked about the global. I don't think that when people talk, the queen is in a position that she can talk about the Commonwealth or she can talk about the nation. And God knows she's had a crazy year with her family that she's glad that she could look at some other problem and communicate on someone else's crisis. And it's not just in her little uh, palace, but everyone will respond to their community and to what makes sense. And that will make it that more real and that more authentic because no one wants to hear me talk about what's going on in the world. They'll say, you know, that's great. You know, tell me where, you know, which shop did you buy that, that crystal ball or that, you know, and what gets her the ability to talk about that. But I can talk within my wheelhouse. I can talk within what makes sense for me to do it and then to show that, that it's open. And I think that is the same. So if every person you know, we, we, want, we all want to be guided by whichever government or whichever legal body, uh, like a political body is, is controlling us. And then within our own structures. So if, if you're running your own firm, you, you want to sit there and say, you know, when was the last time I touched, you know, in, in, you know, whether it was, you know, emailing someone in my group or saying, is everyone okay? I, I know clients that are having these virtual drinks every Friday or doing things. That, that will bring some kind of community. And again, people are craving it because we're social. We, you know, th th this, you know th this is kind of worn off, I think, for a lot of people, this idea of, you know, of staying at home in their pajamas and doing the work. After a while, you want to get outside. And I know, you know, I'm, I'm just so happy because in Canada with us hibernating and then the weather coming nice, we're getting some kind of polar vortex starting tomorrow and we're having snow on Friday. And I go, yes, because it'll keep people in the houses. And so it's, it's finding some way to cope and to touch. And the one thing is when you reach out to someone and it doesn't matter, you know, why, if, if it's just to say, like, I'll just say, just checking that you're okay. That will mean a lot when, when, then when we get out of this darkness, because also then say, you know what? She really cared. She cared and it wasn't again, the ka-ching or her meter was on that she was, you know, looking at me for, you know, you know, am I looking for some business? I cared. And people care that you care. 
And so that's why it's, it's, you don't have to care by slapping all these documents and saying, look how smart I am. Look how much information I have. Look what I can do for you. Because after a while, people say, you know what, I'm done. But if, if that firm that was sending out all that stuff would just reach out to their clients and say, just making sure that you're okay. How's the family? Is there anything that we can do for you? Can we drop off some food if you need some food? That will ensure that you get a mandate. Not that that's why you're doing it, but people will come to you and say, that's the lawyer I want. You'll be remembered for how you behave during this crisis. And now's the time to be a trusted advisor uh, and not just a person who uh, slams content at people. Yeah, we are talking about then touches sort of on, on, on a personal level that we, or, we or communicate authentic. individual to individual. Authentic. You want to be authentic. Um, I mean, and, and it, you know, even if it is to, if, if you can find the equivalence for when you're doing it to a, an organization, it, it's, it's, it's just showing that you care. It's showing that you're thinking about them. It's like, you know, what we were saying that when you communicate, it's not about you. It's about them. It's about them listening with those cans and, you know, what do they want to hear? And they don't want to hear marketing stuff. I, and I, but, and I, cause I know we were talking about this when, when we were getting ourselves organized, I still don't think there's anything wrong with using LinkedIn, you know, over at Gur and sending out that, yes, you got, you became partner or that you've been listed on Legal 500. I think, why not? Do not be ashamed. Do not think it's bad in, in bad times to promote that. You, you, you want to be normal. You want to do it, but make sure how you're doing it, when you're doing it, what makes sense, and not that if there's a really bleak day that you sit there and say, oh, hi, guys, I just you know, made it on this, it's going to get lost. And yeah, people don't, don't be and tone say, deaf. Yeah, yeah, it is. So you're not listening. Don't be tone deaf, but let's say you're showing off about uh, that you were ranked on the top 500 lawyers. Maybe try to relate it to your clients. Say, uh, you know, I, I uh, love helping my clients to, to do such and such, and I'm so thrilled that it's been recognized by my peers. So at least you relate it to your clients a little bit, although you're still showing off. Uh, speaking of the crystal ball uh, that you were mentioning, Deborah, I would like us to sort of to go to our last question of this webinar. Uh, and that would be for both of you. Do you have any parting advice as we hopefully, that is at least what we are hoping and expecting, will return to normal soon? What would be your advice? Well, I, I'd, if I may begin, um, uh, I'd say to communicate frequently. Don't just make noise, but communicate frequently because you don't want silence to be filled by rumors. Uh, communicate with authenticity. When you communicate, prioritize health and safety over profits. Profits will still come, but you're going to be remembered for how you behave during the crisis towards various stakeholders, particularly your clients and your employees and your colleagues. Um, you could still do preparation for future crises. As I mentioned before, you could have other waves, you could have cyber attacks. You could, have, um, uh, you could have financial distress. We discussed a little bit about financial troubles. Be open, uh, be consistent in your messaging and be concise. Uh, it's okay to make mistakes. This is uncharted territory. Just move on and, and admit your mistakes with humility. Um, and because communication is two ways, don't forget to listen and adapt your message to whatever audience it is to your client concerns, your employee concerns. If times are bad, perhaps your landlord has concerns, whoever it is, make sure you adapt your message to them. Uh, and if I may be uh, permitted, I'll just uh, quote John Lennon to close. He once said, everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. So let's take the uh, optimistic part of that, the uh, everything will be okay in the end. And uh, I'll send it back to you in Sweden, Johan. Oh, thank you. It's it's a good way of uh, it's a good word to to keep the eyes on top of the horizon in a way. Uh, Deborah, any advice from your side? Yeah, I mean, but what Larry? I mean, I I only echo what Larry said. And and one thing to add is that there's no playbook. This this is a one this is a one once I pray once in a lifetime uh, crisis that any of us or any of our children will ever have to go through. And so with that being the case, there is no playbook. There's no 
There's no instruction manual. There's no right or wrong. So this is an opportunity to be creative and not to go crazy, but be creative, be transparent, be clear. Even, I mean, I love saying to use things like a lab, use it to explore things that you've been wanting to do. Here's a great chance. If you are trying to think of things that you want to do with your practice that you thought, eh, I'm never going to have the chance, try it now. Use this as an opportunity because I don't think there'll ever be a better chance for you to do it because, you know, whatever, however your pipeline is, whatever you're doing, you're still saving time by working from home. So whatever time that you would have, let's say, uh, I've been telling people, time that you would have uh, been commuting, use that to, to play, to, to be creative, to think how can you do things better and how can you either be better prepared or to, to provide the service that you want to do in a better way. Thank you so much, both Larry and Deborah, for sharing these thoughts with these thoughts with us regarding the importance of communications, the importance of being authentic, be concise, listen. There isn't any playbook, as you are pointing out, Deborah. And I especially like the fact that we should try to be creative, to try to create something new going into the new normal. Uh, so a huge thanks for this hour. If there are any questions which hasn't been, been filed to us, please don't hesitate to email us uh, um, uh, and any questions or, or continued discussion that you would like to have. And please stay tuned for future webinars from Legal Mundo. Thank you very much to all of you.